So parametric disc equations describes um, a certain way that you can provide information with equations. And actually, um, you've all been exposed to it before. You've all seen it before under certain contexts, under certain situation. Um, so let me describe the general idea of what it means to have parametric equations and then show you how you've done this before, at least in one very fundamental example. So let's imagine that I have a graphing grid. It's quick and crappy. And so if you have a graph of some sort, uh, let's make it look like it typically would. The normal way we're used to looking at this is f of x is equal to some formula. And so let's um, point out that this is a replacement notation for y. And then so we could say like y equals x squared or y equals x plus three, you can have a parabola, you can have a line, you can have all kinds of different things, right? So the normal way we're used to seeing this is where you are given an equation that has a relationship between the x and the y values, that y is equal to the square of whatever the x value is or something like that. And so that the graph is the solution set the solution set for one of these kind of equations, meaning it's the picture of all the pairs of values for X and Y that satisfies the equation. So for example, if you had um, three and nine, then that pair of values would satisfy the equation y equals x squared. So that point would be on the graph of y equals x squared. But that pair of values does not satisfy the equation y equals x plus three. So that point would not be on the graph of y equals x plus three. And the graph is the picture of all the solutions to the equation, the pairs of values that satisfy some equation. So that's our standard way we've been looking at graphs. It's just a set of points that have a certain property, that meet a certain condition. So now we're going to consider this a little bit differently. Let's say um, that you have uh, a different variable, like t is often common, and that you, um, you set, uh, let's say, that you set an X value and a Y value for a point to be achieved with some formula for T. So you have some formulas and then you go ahead and imagine that you're plotting the X and the Y values that you get for the same value of T. So maybe if I have some point on a graph, then that would be x of some particular t naught, y of some particular t naught. And then some other point on a graph, maybe up here, would be perhaps x of t1 and y of t1. And that when you let the t values range between t sub zero and t sub one, like maybe t sub one half or whatever, whatever your intermediary values are, that you can also get points which form a graph. So you can create a graph by mapping points where there's two functions, one for the x value of the points and one for the y values of the points where each one of those is determined by some third variable, often a T is used, a parametric variable, and that you then get a graph of those points. 
So x of t would be equal to some x value and y of t is equal to the y value you get, but they're functions of t, just some other variable. So this may sound weird or convoluted or hard to imagine, so let me immediately give you an example that you've done many, many times before. So let's say I let x be equal to cosine of t, and I let y be equal to sine of t. Well, what this is, is exactly how you defined cosine and sine for some angle t on a circle, on the unit circle. So if I graph all the points where x is equal to cosine of t and y is equal to sine of t, I get the unit circle where I can visualize how I got a particular point by recognizing that if I let t be whatever that radian angle measurement is, well, then the x value of that point would be cosine t, and the y value of that point would be sine t. So expressing all the x and y coordinates of points on a unit circle by defining functions that looked at the angle you've swept out in that unit circle to define what the x and the y values are is an example of parametric equations in play. Because you have a third variable, and usually you use theta, but you can call it t, it's a dummy variable, you can use whatever letter you want. And then you let the points on the graph be determined by some function of the angle. And if the x value is the cosine of the angle and the y value is the sine of the angle, and you plot all the points you would get as you let t go through all possible values, you'll get a unit circle and you'll just get a graph. So one of the things to think about right away, structurally about what's going on here in this first example that we've done before, is how it is an example of parametric equations and that notice that even though the, the function you use for t to get x and to get y, these are both functions, but that the graph you get of x and y doesn't look anything like cosine or sine, and it's not a function of x in terms of y. It's, it's not a function because it fails the vertical line test. So that's a lot to think about. So we can, we'll definitely look at a lot more examples, but let's pause there and see if there are any questions so far. Okay, so let's, uh, so, so this is an idea that we now wanna sort of explore. Parametric equations are equations in which you define the x value of points on a graph and the y value of points on a graph by some functions, x of t and y of t, and that when you put those two equations together and you let t run through some values, in this case t is just a member of the real numbers, then you can make a graph of all the pairs of values for x and y that you would get for all the different types of t values that you could plug in, in the domain of, of these two functions. Uh, let's try this, there we go. Okay, so let's, um, let's look at another example to try to think about how we would work with things like this and how this is different than what we're used to and what you might get. Um, so let's say we did something similar. And again, we don't have to use t, that's one of the first most common ones used but let's say we consider the following. Consider, let's say x is equal to two, and I'm gonna go ahead and use theta here just to look familiar from your first example of parametric equations, and also to remind us that it doesn't have to be t, it could be any dummy variable. And let's say y is equal to four sine theta. 
So how do we begin exploring what a graph of something like this might look like? So the first thing is that if you had an X and a Y equation, what you would probably do is you'd make a table where you plug in for values for X and you see what you get for Y. Because we've typically thought of X being the input variable and Y being the output variable. However, uh, when you have two different equations, one for X and one for Y, both using theta, then theta is the input variable and X and Y are both output variables. So we can make a table by making an initial column for the input variable and then making two output columns for the X and Y values that are output and then see what you get. Uh, and then each thing you get for X and Y will be a point that you plot on a graph of X and Y. But the thing to notice is that theta is not necessarily on the graph anywhere. So one of the ways to imagine that is you could imagine sort of a third axis of theta values. So, so that you can imagine going through and then each value for theta will lead to a point on a graph of X and Y. So for example, if I plug in a zero for theta here, then X would be two times cosine of zero. Cosine of zero was one, so X would be two. Y would be four times sine of zero. Sine of zero is zero, so Y would be zero. So I can imagine I, uh, on theta, when theta is a zero, that I can then get a corresponding point out of that, namely, to zero. That point right there. So similarly, uh, if we just sort of plug in some nice values just to keep things simple, uh, let's say I plug in um, pi over two. So if I plug in pi over two, Put it over here, I'm considering when theta is equal to pi over two. So cosine of pi over two has now become zero. So two times that would be zero. And sine of pi over two has become one. So y would be four times one, which is four. So now instead of being at the point zero two, I'm sorry, two zero, I'm at the point zero four, which would be up here. And I could sort of do this pi, three pi over two, <clears throat> two pi. I could imagine go through some nice input variable values that make the trig functions come out nice. And you can also imagine that as, as t, I'm sorry, as theta ranges from zero to pi over two, then the points smoothly go from two zero to zero four, meaning that I could imagine that something like this would be going on. And then I would end up recognizing that when I get to pi, everything switched, but now I'm over here at negative two. And when I get three pi over two, then this is down here at negative four. So of course the functions, if I didn't have the two and the four there, they would just be a unit circle. But with the two on the cosine, which determines the X value, and the four on the sine, which determines the y value, then the circle has been stretched in the x direction to have a width of two from left to right. And it's been stretched in the y direction to have a, a height and depth of four when I go up and down from the center. And so that this makes an ellipse. If I just connect the dots as we like to do with graphs. And that as theta just keeps going, I would just keep retracing these same points, just like a unit circles points are retraced if the angles just keep growing and growing and growing, get an ellipse here. Okay, so I used this example of an ellipse uh, and we're actually going to look a lot at uh, other ellipses and other conics in our last topic of the class in 10.4. Um, but I look, I use this, this sort of modification of a, of a unit circle in, to become an ellipse as an example for parametric equations because hopefully it still feels kind of 
approachable or understandable. And at the same time, I illustrated how you can kind of go through a thought process and organize how you're thinking about things where you now have to recognize that you have one input variable with X and Y both being output variables and that each value for the input variable leads to a pair of values or a point on the graph. And that if you sort of make a table, a, you know, a three column table, you can kind of think through this. You can sometimes think of the input variables values on a separate axis and imagine those values changing up here, leading to points on the graph. So when, when theta was at zero, we got this point. When theta was pi over two, we got that point. And that each point on the theta number line produces a different point on a graph. Now, uh, another way to think about this sort of more geometrically or physically is that you can imagine T like time. It's often is time in many real world situations and X and Y being coordinates of a map. So just another sort of way to wrap your mind around this different way of, of creating one of these math things is that you can imagine that you have a path. Um, and I'm going to draw this as an example. So you can imagine that you have a path, which is a function of t. But the way you determine the path is by looking at the points on the path, which is a two-dimensional curve by imagining that it's described because you have something, a function determining the X value for each point in time and something determining the Y value for each point in time. But uh, one of the values for thinking about this is that this is one of the ways parametric equations is used in the real world quite frequently, is sort of a parametric representation of a path uh, or something like that. Um, and then additionally, it helps you sort of think about this because you kind of want to imagine that my, there's some point in time where you started. Like normally we're used to thinking of like um, Y sub zero or F sub zero or A sub zero as being your initial value. Well, in this case, the initial value would be P sub zero and we don't know where that would be. So maybe over here, is P sub zero. Like meaning if I plug in a zero for T, what's the point on my graph that I, I start with when time is at zero? And it's even possible that you can then imagine that as time marches forward from here, well then I'm carving out points on my path, but that then gives a sense of movement of a point along a path. So maybe I could imagine that I could think about each minute in time where I was walking along this path that I'm creating as I go walking. And maybe sometimes I go quicker and I jump further on the path because I was running or something. You just don't know. It depends on the functions. But the idea is that you can also imagine that this means you can think about this path created in a directionally sensitive way. That instead of just having a curve sitting there and imagining left to right, that maybe you, you don't even have left to right. You have an up and a down and a forward and a backward, and that you can imagine a point traveling along the path as time advances. Maybe it circles around. It could even advance on a path and then come backward on the path. It could turn around and come back. All kinds of things become possible. It could be simple, like a point on a unit circle, just circling around as theta goes around and around over and over again. But it could be a path that's like this, where it's not a unit circle and you move along the path and you may turn around and come back and different things can happen uh, when you allow for constructing a path with parametric equations. Then uh, a, a much greater variety of possibilities exist in terms of what happens and what you get. Questions, comments, discussions about this idea?
All right, so um, let's look at maybe an example from the book. Now they, well actually, since I just described it and I got us to the point where the concept makes sense, let's look at a definition. So with this discussion I just had, consider this following definition, which I am going to refer from page 709. Yeah. And that is of a positive orientation. Yeah. So pen's fighting me. So um, basically, let's look at what it says and see if it makes sense in the discussion we just had. The direction in which a parametric curve is generated as the parametric, uh, the parameter, the parametric variable increases is called the positive orientation of the curve and is indicated by arrows on the curve, which I've already done. So in this case, this is the positive orientation of the curve. The, this direction along the curve is the positive orientation of the curve. So again, it says the direction, so a positive orientation is a direction, and it's the direction in which a parametric curve is generated, as if you imagine that it's created one point at a time, or as t goes through its values as the parameter increases. So as the T value gets larger, which way are you going when you create the points on the curve? Okay, so having said that, uh, let's look at an example. Hmm. I really don't give anything I like in the beginning. So I'm gonna go ahead and go right to the exercise set for an example before we look at the next concept in the section. So let's maybe take a look at, wow. Fifteen. So it gives us x is equal to square root of t plus 4. And y is equal to 3 root t. So I've got that right. Yeah. And it tells us that zero is less than or equal to t is less than or equal to 16. So they've got a couple of instructions they give, but I'm gonna just use this as an example problem for us to explore together. So first of all, let's try to visualize a graph of what we might have here. So for example, I'm observing right away that as t goes through its range of values, neither of these functions will ever take on a negative value. So that means this pathway is entirely up in the first quadrant. And so you can imagine trying to explore this as I described by setting up a table of values where you produce t values and then you figure out what x and y would be. And you can imagine that the t number line basically just goes from 0 up to 16 for the t values. And you can imagine starting with a 0 and exploring. So let me pause here and see if there are questions about how I set this up or how to look at these before we start plotting points. <laughs> 
Okay, so if t is zero, then what we see is that the x value is four and the y value is zero. So this plots to the point one, two, three, four. So I could think of that as, you know, a pathway and that's the starting point of the pathway. This is sort of the initial point. This is P of zero, if you want to think of it as a path. So maybe we'll think of this as the point at time zero. So then we would probably want to, like we usually do when exploring with guess and check or plugging in and making a table of values, is you'd like to plug in points that are easy to evaluate and then imagine that all the intermediary values, you could connect the dots. So I'm taking square roots of my numbers. So the next one I would plug in is a one. The square root of one is one. So for X, it would increase to five and y we get square root of one is one times three and i would get three so it looks like the x value is going to just keep going up the y value is just going to keep going up so the curve in general should move up and to the right but i can just plot the value five three so one two three is here five is the next one over so it's like there And you could think of that as the point on the path when t is equal to one or p of one. So we'd advance to four just to make our square rooting life easier. So for the x value, square root of four is two. So that would make x advance to six. And three times two is six. So the y value would advance to six. So then I would get six, six. And my scale's gonna run into trouble pretty quick here. Here's where six is, so I'm up there. Questions so far? So basically given a T value, we, we're just determining our X and Y points based on the, the the functions given for x and y? That's the starting point to understand parametric equations because initially, like when you first had your very first equations with two variables with x and y, you just kind of plug things in for x, see what you get for y, you plotted points and connected the dots. And then later we looked for patterns and things like that. Well, of course, we're not gonna spend months doing this as examples, but this is the way to initially wrap your mind around what's going on and to keep in mind that you have things like, well, what is the domain of my input variable? Because that provides a particular restriction on your graph, you know, so that you can imagine my, my pathway starts somewhere. And this idea of plugging in things to make a path one point at a time or at one point in time helps also wrap your mind around it, but you kind of have to go through that. But this is not how in any way, shape or form how you do all of these problems. This will be how you do some problems. And of course, you can use a graphing utility that'll allow you to put in two equations parametrically and make their graph. Does that answer your question, Parjeet? Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's keep this going just to sort of see as we would with a normal equation if after a few points we think there's a pattern, if we can better understand what's going on. In this case, when we get to 16, we, we kind of run out of points, right? So, um, Back, there we go. So what's the next value for T I would plug in? I lose lose everybody. Nine. Nine? Yeah, because we want to plug in something that makes sense for what we're doing and we're plugging in perfect squares so that our square roots are easy to evaluate. And again, like when you're plugging in values for X to graph an equation, you can pick whatever X values you want. So, uh, so now um, looking at what I would get for X, square root of nine is three, so that would go up to seven. 
but then this would go up to nine. So I would go over to seven and then go up to nine, which is my scale is up here is a nine. So let's put this over here, y equals three square root of t. Give myself a little bit more room anyway. So then I would go over one and up and nine, up to nine. So are we seeing a pattern at all here? Let's try one more. 16, square root of 16 is four. Four plus four is eight. Three times four is 12. So that means if I went over to eight, I'd go up to 12, one, two, three, up here. And again, we could call this P of four, P of nine, of 16. So what do you guys think? Graphically, do you see a pattern? Is it linear? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you notice, every time we move over one in the x direction, you go up three. And that's just staying the same every time. So we could sort of try to think about this. All right, once I get once I get my points here, I can maybe see that there's a line going on here. Now I will point out that I'm not going to draw my line before the four, and actually I didn't mean to do an arrow up there, so let me fix that. It's a habit. I just meant to connect the dots with a line, that we can see there's a line here. Oops, I didn't need to erase those. Uh, let's go back. There we go. Blue, please, not eraser. So what we end up with, because of the restricted domain on T, we end up with what you may recall is called a line segment. So yeah, why, why is this a line? All right, so this brings us to the next thing. So here's one of the things you can do with parametric equations. Well, parametric equations are a system of three equations in two variables. And when you have a system of three equations in two variables, then you can substitute and reduce into one equation with two variables. So one of the approaches to dealing with parametric equations to try to help see what's going on is to try to eliminate the parametric variable and get back to the equations in X and Y that we're used to. So for example, if I take this pair that we have here, so I'm gonna say, consider that if we think of this system we have where X was equal to the square root of T plus four and Y was equal to three times the square root of T, that we could combine these and eliminate t. So for example, this one would give me that y divided by three is equal to the square root of t. And then I could take that result for square root of t and use substitution in for the other one, in for that square root of t, and that would give me that x is equal to y over three plus four. Or if I multiply everything by three and solve for y, I would get that y is equal to three x minus 12. So what we can see is that this is a line with slope three and y-intercept equal to minus 12. And so that's, if you look at that line, it has a slope of three, and if I continued it down to the y-axis, it would um, 
it would hit it at minus 12. That would be the y-intercept. So one of the things to think about with parametric equations is that you can try, it's not always easily possible, but you can try to convert parametric equations into um, a regular equation with just x and y in it to try to recognize graphically what that might look like. Questions, comments about that? All right, well, let's, let's consider this further then. What is the difference between what we started with and the xy equation that it simplifies to? y equals 3x minus 12. Compared to the parametric equations we started with. What's the difference? So this is hopefully a point of us discussing, of discussion for us to understand this better so that we can see when we have parametric equations, why that's important or how that's different from what we, we normally have. So Paul, Paul points out that there was a starting and an end point. So yeah, one of the things to see is that if you eliminate the T variable, then you lose all of the information that the T variable was contributing. For example, in this case, because T had a restriction from zero to 16, we didn't get a whole line, we just got a line segment. But if I then, eliminate t and I'm looking for the equation that I get, I get the equation of the entire infinitely long line. It includes the line segment that the parametric equations would have produced, but it also includes a bunch of other points that would not have worked for the parametric equation presentation. And so you lose information. So it's, it's helpful to sort of maybe see an X and a Y equation that helps understand what the graph of the parametric equations is doing. But you have to realize that they may not be equivalent. In fact, they're typically not equivalent. Now, what if they didn't put any restrictions on this? So I'm gonna change this. Let's try this. What if I sort of, um, didn't have these restrictions, if there was no restriction on the T variable, can someone offer up what would the graph have been like if we didn't restrict the T variable at all and just started with the parametric equations themselves? Then what would the graph be like? So what's the, oops. What's the graph if no, uh, if the given restricted range goes away? So we had a starting point when t was zero. We had an ending point when t was 16 based on the fact that they just told us that t has to be between zero and 16. But what if they didn't say that? What do you get? Suggestions, thoughts, discussion, questions? <laughs> 
No opinions, no questions? So if we're not restricting it from zero to 16? Correct. Um, then wouldn't it just be the same thing then as y equals 3x minus 12? Just a linear, linear line? You might think so, but the answer is no. Okay, so the thing to recognize is if they hadn't given us those restrictions on the T variable, the very definition of the parametric equations themselves provides its own restriction on the T variable. Because the parametric equations produce their values using square roots. As I mentioned in the beginning, just looking at the equations functions, you can see they're always non-negative because they have roots in them and there's nothing to make them negative. So they were limited to the first quadrant. That was even before the restrictions of the variable. So basically, even though um, they don't list a restriction on t, because you're taking the square root of t, and these are all real valued graphs, that means t has to be non-negative. It has to be greater than or equal to zero. So the functions don't let t be a negative number. And that means the first point of t when t was equal to zero, and then all the values after that when t is positive produces an upward orientation starting from the point four zero and so you would not get a line segment but you would get a line that starts at the point four zero and then continues on infinitely upward but never goes below the x-axis or to the left of a four i believe the name of that is a ray So you would get a line that starts at a point and then from that point goes on forever in one direction, but never goes in the other direction from that point. And so even if we don't restrict T, the very direct definition of the functions used would restrict T. And keep in mind, there's some other interesting things going on here, and then I'll move on to the next, our final topic of the section. When you have the linear equation, you just see points on a line. But when you have the points on a line arrived at, at particular t values, you can almost think of that, as I mentioned, as like walking along the line on a path. And so, for example, notice that to go from, let's do this, to go from the first point on the path, which was p sub zero here, to the second point on the path, which was p sub one, that took us from here to here, right? Well, then this third point on the line, or the ray, or whatever we wanna call it, this is not p sub two. This is p sub four then this was p sub nine. We chose those nice values to make it easy, but what we did is we went down along the t axis more aggressively, or the t number line more aggressively to get to friendlier points. And what we ended up getting was points that were equal, equally spaced along the line. So imagine that, that t was time. That means that you're advancing along the line in each of these cases, but not in equivalent time intervals. That to get from the first to the second point took one hour. Let's say T is in hours. Then to get from the next second point to the third point took three hours because you had to go from P, T being one to T being four. Then to get to the next point down on the line, T went from four to nine, so that took five hours. So what this means is as the point is advancing down the path or the ray or this line, each time it advances, as it's advancing, it's slowing down. It's moving less quickly 
the next equal length along the path is going to take seven hours to complete. So there's this whole dynamic that we can imagine that not only is the path, the line restricted because by using square roots, we can't have any negative T values. But on top of that, we can envision that as we're walking along the ray in this infinite direction, we're walking slower and slower and slower. And so there's a whole possibility of thinking about the speed at which you're traveling along this pathway because you're thinking about, well, how far did I go in the last period of time that advanced? Questions, comments, discussions about that? Okay, so let's take a look at the, we have 15 minutes left. Let's take a look at the final concept in the section about parametric equations. And so what we just looked at is that one of the things you might wanna imagine is being able to make a graph and imagine the path of the graph being generated at a particular point of time T, and that produces something called a positive orientation and that restrictions on t may make you only have a part of a graph, but you could eliminate the t variable and see if you get an equation in x and y that gives you an overall idea of what kind of a graph it was. That might be a little harder to see with the, uh, with the t in it. For example, in what we just looked at with square roots in it, you wouldn't normally think you'd get a straight line, but when you eliminated t, you had a linear equation in x and y. So now let's, uh, let's say that we had just without a specific yet, some graph from parametric equations. And so I'm gonna do this curly thing again, just to remind people about how it can be different. So let's even, I'm gonna put a point here and say maybe that's P sub zero, so that we imagine that T starts at zero and goes off toward infinity. This is the t-axis going from zero to infinity. So you can imagine the point advancing along in time. Well, you can still ask our favorite type of calculus question, that if I have a particular point in my journey of my graph, what about the tangent line? kind of missed. So we can still go back to our favorite question about finding the tangent line to a graph, even if the graph comes from parametric equations. So the, the graph may not be of a function. It may fail the vertical line test. It may be a circle. It may be something more complicated. So this may be is at some particular t value that we would want to say uh, can we find the tangent line to the graph at some point Uh, X, Y. So you'd have an X value, you'd have a Y value. Now normally we've been thinking of having a function where Y is equal to some F of X and then we would just have the derivative. So normally to do this we would say normal, oh, so let's do this, normally Normally, we need x, y, and n, slope of the line. And we found that m was equal to dy dt. 
oops, sorry, dy dx, getting ahead of myself. So dy dx was the Leibniz notation where we would take the change in y with respect to the change of x and then we would let delta x go to zero and we would get dy dx. And that's the slope of the line. And if you know the slope of the line and the point, which in our case would be the point of tangency, then you can come up with the equation of the line. So if we're, we have some point, what we still need, as always, is the slope of the tangent line. But what are we working with? We're working with not x, f of x. We're working with um, basically x as a function of t and y as a function of t. And we want dy dx. We want dy dx, but we have x of t and y of t. Okay, so, um, well, normally if we just took derivatives, what would we get? Since we have x as a function of t and y as a function of t, if we differentiate those in Leibniz notation, we get dx dt, and we get dy dt. Now we have two functions to differentiate. We have the function that tells us how x is changing with respect to time and how y is changing with respect to time. But what we want is how y is changing with respect to x. So we, uh, we can multiply. <laughs> Um, we can, or I should say, dividing, which means multiplying. So what we end up doing is we can say that dy dt, I'm sorry, dy dx, what we want, is equal to dy dt divided by dx dt. <laughs> So when we have parametric equations, if we want to find the tangent line to a graph from parametric equations, that means we want dy dx. Well, the way you can get that is just differentiate your x function and your y function and divide, and divide the dy dt result by the dx dt result. And notice both of these derivatives will be in terms of t. So you will get the derivative on the path in the x, y direction as a function of t. So they give you this as a theorem. So let's make note of this. This is really our, our theorem for the section, theorem 10.1 on page 714. And so luckily, uh, even though conceptually it's hard to see how all this fits together, but um, just procedurally it's easy to do. You just take the derivative and then divide the derivative of with respect to y by the one with respect to x, or the x one and the y one. So, um, yeah, uh, let's maybe look at an example. So let's say we looked at that uh, 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 similar to the ellipse that we did before. So I'm going to take a look at example eight, which is on page 714. Last example of the section, part B, last part of the problem of the example. So it says X, equals four cosine t and y is equal to 16 sine t. And the goals are, it says, interpret the result at which the curve has a horizontal or vertical tangent. So it says, find dy dx for the following curves and interpret the result and determine points where the curve has a horizontal 
or vertical tangent line. Uh, now it says, does give us here restrictions for whatever reason, zero is less than or equal to t is less than or equal to two pi. So again, sine and cosine have a period of two pi. So if I let t go from zero to two pi, they get all the values you're ever going to get from those. But in terms of a pathway, you're just not going to be retracing this ellipse over and over and over again. So first, let's say find dy dx. So um, if we look at dy dt, the derivative of 16 sine t would be 16 cosine t. And if we look at dx dt, taking the derivative of four cosine t, derivative of cosine is minus sine, so we would get minus four sine t. So to get dy dx, you just divide these. <laughs> It's dy dt divided by dx dt. So if I divide the negative four and the 16 and I have cosine over sine, this gives me that dy dx. So sine over cosine is tangent. So cosine over sine is cotangent. And so I'd get minus four cotangent of t. So the thing to note here is that I have a formula for the slope of the tangent to the ellipse that this thing makes. But the slope is, the, the formula for the, der the derivative for the slope is not a function in x, it's a function in t. So I, I plug into it, at what point t is on the interval from zero to two pi. And the derivative doesn't even tell me at that point where I am on the ellipse. It just tells me the slope of the tangent line there. I'd have to plug the t value into the x and y functions to see what point I was at, what the point of tangency actually is. Questions, comments, discussions about that? Okay, well again, if we think about this graphically, because it asks us to interpret and look for places where you'd have horizontal or vertical um, tangents. So just to give, a, give myself a little space here. So if what I have here is I have a graph of an ellipse where in the x direction, it maxes out at four. In the y direction, it goes up to 16. And t is the angle. So when I'm at an angle of zero, then the tangent line is going to be the line tangent to the ellipse. And that has a vertical, that's a vertical line, so its slope is undefined. Well, cotangent is undefined at zero. <laughs> then if I go up to an angle of pi over two, then I'm up here. That's supposed to be on the top of my ellipse. Well, then I'd have a horizontal line, right? So as, t, as my t value goes from zero and the angle goes up and up and up, when I get up to a, pi over two, well then I have a horizontal tangent line and dy dx is negative four cotan of pi over two, but cotan of pi over two is zero. Similarly, when you get to pi, it's undefined because you have a vertical line on the opposite side. And when you get to three pi over two, it goes back to zero. So those are the horizontal and vertical tangent lines will be the zero and undefined values of the derivative as you would expect, but now it's a function in T.